Hello everybody, this is Brian, and welcome to Twilight Struggle Play the Experts, the game where I play the experts so that you can beat the stuffing out of all of your friends. Now, this is our third game of Twilight Struggle on the series, and I am happy to say that after our epic game last time in which I snatched victory from the jaws of defeat from the jaws of victory, the score, the overall score, stands at Experts 0, Twilight Struggle, Play the Experts, Host 2. So that means we are going to continue to attempt to climb, to climb the hill, the Mount Everest of ratings, and play an even higher rated player. And so today I have a very exciting opponent for us. Uh, I'm not sure whether his name is John Isson or Jonathan, uh, but I have played him 15 times in the past, of which I have beaten him exactly two, two, two times. So my record stands at two and 13 against Jonathan or Jonathan, as uh, as the case may be. And let's just get right on in there and play another game of Twilight Struggle. So, as we see our opening hand, we also see his setup. And notice that he has, he has eschewed going into Yugoslavia or Austria or anywhere like that. He has just piled all his stuff into East Germany and Poland, which probably implies he may have, he may have Truman Doctrine. He doesn't have independent reds because we do, but... He may just also not have a hand where he wants to play for Europe very much unless he's trying to misdirect us. Now, I have seen John do this before. You know, it's a fairly common opening for him, so I don't draw a huge amount of conclusions. Probably just one of his favorite openings, particularly if he's not going to play for Europe. And so he's done that. And then we look at our actual hand hand, and, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. But it would be a lot less mixed of a bag if it wasn't for if it wasn't for the fact that I have the containment card and there is really no contest in terms of what what I'm going to headline here because containment is going to add one influence to every single one of these cards it's going to give me the option to eat if I want to I could even space Nasser if I don't want to let him straight into Egypt right away, depending on how the map goes. So it'll have it give us more options. It absolutely guarantees that even if he purges us, we'll still be able to cover a blockade if we need to. Now, in bad news, we don't have either decolonization or destalinization. We don't have the Middle East scoring card, which we would love to have. We don't have the Marshall plan. So, you know, there's some good cards we didn't get, but once you add one to every one of the ops, this is actually a pretty darn decent ops hand. You know, we'd have two cards that we could play for four ops. One of them is socialist government, so we'd effectively get one net, one net influence. Nor add, we can play for four ops. It's a decentish hand. We've got some, you know, we've got some of his events. We've got to play around, but mostly they're not the super bad events. And you know the whatever the baddest one is, we'll probably send to space. So, I think we can go with a pretty traditional setup here. We'll do the old 4-3, and we will pile our extra guys into, into Iran and try to keep him at bay. So, let us headline containment. The only decent headline card we have, but an excellent headline card. And what is he doing? He is playing defectors. And of course, whenever I see that, I always think, oh shoot, he defectored my card. And I realize, oh right, he only is canceling his own event. So he must not have had much great to do because he just did a null headline. But now he's going to take a big old coup with NATO, not active yet. All right, could have been worse for, you know, he did a four card on that and he knocked us out, but he didn't. He didn't knock us, knock himself in, so now the Middle East is sitting, sitting empty there. All right, so this is a reasonably common situation. The situation where the Soviet player takes their first coup, 
and the result is nothing in Iran. The Americans exactly knocked out, but no Soviets in. And when that happens, it means that we can either go do other things, go fill up areas that we want to, but the DEFCON remains four, so a coup could kind of come out of the woodwork at any time, or we have to take coups in other places. So this is, it's unlike the situation where the Soviets get in, either a little bit or a lot in Iran, the Americans are kind of deciding, well, do they want the the last coup in Iran or the second to last coup in Iran? That's the common situation or one of the common situations, the other one being that they just utterly fail to get into Iran and the Americans start spreading everywhere into Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. But in this situation, what I tend to do as the U.S. is go ahead and take a coup, usually in Iraq. Well, the reason is getting the DEFCON to three means there's that last coup out there. And he's probably not going to want to take a coup right now, exposing himself in Panama or somewhere. If he he gets in, then then he might have the CIA card and have some DEFCON 2 problems, make it hard to get rid of the CIA card. So he's probably not going to just take a coup just to lower it to 2 if he doesn't see some other advantage. And that means that by having it, the DEFCON at 3... If he goes into Iran, if he sneaks back in there, or if he sneaks into other places that he might wish to go, then, like decolonizing or something, then then I could take a coup and get in somewhere good and lock it down at DEFCON 2. He doesn't want that. So I kind of want it to be at DEFCON 3. The other reason I want it to be at DEFCON 3 is that it might stay at DEFCON 3 through the whole turn. If it stays at DEFCON 3, it means it's going to drop to DEFCON 4 at the beginning of the next turn. If it drops DEFCON 4, well, that means that I'm going to get a coup too, probably. So, in other words, if I get a coup on next turn, a battleground coup, then I'm going to have military ops, and I'm not going to lose two points to military ops. So the goal here is to... The reason to do a coup now is, one, get military ops this turn, so that we don't have nothing. Two, get the DEFCON to three, so that we can intimidate him out of going into Iran. So Because if he goes into Iran, then he knows that if I coup him, he won't get a coup back. And three to try to kind of hold the DEFCON at three for the rest of the turn, uh, given that he doesn't have any other good places to go. So then the question becomes, what card, what card to go in with? Now, our coup is going to be in Iraq, just because it might do some good. We can roll, if we roll a high number, we can knock him out. We do get plus one on all of our ops, so even with a minimum card, we can get one op, or two ops, two, two, one plus one is two, we can get two ops. So that's good, and I'm sort of tempted to use a low harm card. Like, I don't want to make a big pounding try with one of these three cards that would, that would be like a four, and, you know, I could use independent reds and pounded in at three, but it just feels like too much effort for a coup that's not going to probably do very much, where we're really mostly trying to move the DEFCON and get some ops. And the DEFCON might end at two, in which case two is enough ops. So I feel like getting two ops is is, is kind of close to the right amount to get. So I think what I'm going to do is use my least harmful one card, and that's going to be Romanian Abdication, which also is it's useful if maybe someday he'll get the Independent Reds card, and so he can have the three guys in Romania. Yeah, mostly it's a big deal. It does give him fuel for destalinization if he gets destalinization. But we're going to take a coup in Iraq. All right, well, that was better than expected. Better than average. We actually knocked him out. So now that gives him a few problems. 
He does get his three points in Romania. Lucky, lucky him. Let's see what he does. All right, for motion resolution. So he's putting that into effect. And he is moving into Afghanistan, and he is giving himself a presence in the Middle East. And remember, a presence in the Middle East is worth three points. So if he's got a presence in the Middle East, then I need a presence in the Middle East. That is pretty much always my motto, is always have a presence in the Middle East. In fact, even if he didn't have a presence, I still kind of want a presence. But especially when he just got himself one, he went to the effort to get himself one, I feel like I want to get a presence in the Middle East. So the other thing I want to do is I want to be touching Thailand. As soon as the DEF CON moves below four, and sometimes even when it's at four, then I want to be touching Thailand. And that's so that if he were to, for instance, decolonize there, or if he were to suddenly play the Vietnam Revolts card and get right next to Thailand, that I could beat him to control of Thailand. I, he, that way, by touching Thailand and Malaysia, then I can make sure that he can't steal a march on me and get all the way in control of Thailand before I can even get there. So... Because I want to do those two things, establish a reasonably safe presence in the Middle East and touch Thailand, getting ready for possible events later, I need to use a three ops card. Because Lebanon is not a safe place to establish a presence when the DEF CON is three. If I stuck a little dude into Lebanon, he would coo the living bejesus out of it. So I'm going to play Independent Reds, my safest uh, three ops card. It's a two ops card, but I'm getting plus one. And I'm going to go to Jordan and into Malaysia. Now, Jordan, see, is a stability two country. It gives me a presence there that it's not as easy for him to coo out. I mean, yeah, he could coo me in Syria, I mean, in Jordan, just like I could coo him in Syria, but it's just not a super attractive coup because even if you are sort of successful then the DEF CON stays the same so it's not like you're locking your opponent out so I don't think he's going to coup me in Jordan but let's see what he does do instead all right so he did indeed he did indeed play the Middle East scoring card so it's a good thing I good thing I got my presence that's <laughs> that's an example of why you get a presence so he clearly, he saw that I wasn't going to give him a free ride on Middle East Presence, and he decided that it's not worth his effort at this point to try to dominate me there. Because he doesn't touch Iraq, which would be a safe place. I knocked him out. It's good that I knocked him out. If I did, hadn't knocked him out of Iraq, he'd probably fill up Iraq. He'd probably dominate, or I'd have to take some risk or go spewing into Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. But he doesn't touch Iraq, and he does touch Iran, but he knows if he goes into Iran, then I can coup, and I would coup, and that would be very risky for him. Hey, I could even end up dominating the Middle East, so <clears throat> it's, it's turning out to be a wash. And so, hey, we have survived Middle East scoring in an even-steven situation, and that is perfectly good. Now, given that we've just done that, and so the Middle East is going to remain a little more empty and a little less tightly contested, I'm going to go ahead and get Nasser out of my hand, and I'm going to do it by sending him into space. It's, you can't usually send Nasser into space, but right now we've got the plus one, so he counts as a two-op card, so he's legal to space. Now, Nasser is an interesting thing. When you send Nasser away like this, especially as the U.S., well, you know he's going to come back. And so, and there's always the possibility when you send him away and he comes back, he might even come back after Sadat, and that, that could be a little awkward for the Americans, but, you know, that's in the future. And what I don't want to happen right now is him getting into... Egypt right now, and then for easily getting into Libya, you know, I'd rather go ahead and 
have the chance to kind of freely spread through Egypt into Libya, get myself established so I know I'll probably won't ever get utterly wiped out of the Middle East, and meanwhile get my space shot with the minimum possible loss of you know potential operations. Which brings me to the space shot, which I really want to get my space shot before he gets his space shot so I can get my chance at getting two points instead of one point. So it's really only, you know, because he will get one point eventually, it's really only a one point swing here. But I want to go ahead and take the space shot and get the points before he gets them. And we are successful. So two points to the good guys. And so he is going to play the Indo-Pakistani war, but not as the war. He's going to play it for ops. But see, notice that because he had it, he knows he's safe to go into Pakistan. I can't coup him in Pakistan because DEFCON's down at three. And he knows I'm not going to be conducting a war there because he just tossed the war into the discard pile. And so he is safe to start sticking his ugly little red influence points into Pakistan. He's also stuck one into South Korea, which you know, is gradually making our Korean situation uh, a little more difficult. It's a, it's a pretty normal move. So I'm going to go ahead and play NORAD. NORAD for four ops. And what I want to do now is I want to actually fill up France with four. Now, why do I want to put four in there and in, into France? Some would ask, why do I want to put four into France when it only takes three to control it? Others would ask, why do I want to put any into France when there's things like Suez Crisis and De Gaulle out there? Obviously, there's not really socialist governments because I'm holding it and I will either be playing it for a null op and putting the ops back or whatever. So the reason I want to control France is so that I will dominate Europe. Because if I leave it uncontrolled, then he's going to get a chance probably to stick Europe out before I can do it. And I'll miss out on five glorious victory points that I could otherwise have. And five victory points is a lot of victory points. So I want to go ahead and stake a claim to Europe, particularly since he's well on his way to staking a claim to Asia. I might as well be trying to win in one of these two you know, early war battlegrounds. So that's why I want to control it. I want to kind of put some pressure on him uh, and hopefully some point pressure. <laughs> the reason I'm putting four in instead of three is because of cards like Suez and De Gaulle. Now, ultimately, I'll need to fill it to five if I want to make sure that he can't do any headline in action round one shenanigans where he does one thing in headline and then does another and just completely grips and takes France before I can do anything. But four is is good. It, four goes a long way in that and it it means he'd have to use a you know a big grunty four op card if he did, so he'd have to have one, etc, etc, etc. So we're making progress, and hopefully we'll have another op to throw into France before the turn is over. But that's my plan for that. All right, so he is going ahead and playing the U.S.-Japan Mutual Defense Pact, and he is going to go ahead and accept my ownership of Japan in return for grabbing South Korea and sticking another point into India. So... He is really, he's really reaching for Asia. And so, and if you read the map here, you can already see that I've got a big problem in Asia. Because he has completely gripped both Koreas. He's got both Koreas. And he's already got his claws into both Pakistan and India. And I'm nowhere near touching them. So he's gonna, and he's holding the China card, so... Anytime he wants to, he can go, Bleh! and there'll just be red guys everywhere in India and Pakistan and so forth. So that means I need to do some hard thinking about my position RE Asia. There is an opportunity here to attempt to defend 
Asia domination through total number of countries. Because remember, to dominate a region, you need to have the most battlegrounds, and you need to have a non-battleground, which he doesn't yet, but he'll have Afghanistan in due course. And you need to have the most total countries controlled. So the one area where the U.S. has a little bit of early advantage in Asia is getting to those total countries. Because there's a lot of little cheapo countries over in Southeast Asia that I have a little bit easier time getting to than he does. And so I could rack up my score there and keep him from dominating Asia. So an absolute guarantee of total countries is eight. You know, there's 15 countries. So if I can get eight of them, then he definitely can't dominate. And sometimes if I get seven and he only has seven, then he won't dominate. But in order to do that, I am going to have to breach Thailand. I'm going to have to go ahead and put something in Thailand if I want to do that. If I go into Thailand and the DEFCON stays three now, it's going to go to four next turn and he's going to get a coup in Thailand. So that's a risk. Now, right now, in order to even make him not, you know, I the only way I can move the DEFCON to two is by playing Fidel and immediately cooing Cuba, which is a kind of a almost useless move for anything other than getting the DEFCON to two. So I'm not, I don't really want to do that, especially like since Fidel's like three ops. So I'm kind of thinking of going to Thailand and just trying to fortify it to a high amount of influence so either he won't coup it or or his coup won't have as much chance of succeeding because my my chance to defend Asia requires me to get up to Laos Laos Cambodia before him and to be able to poke one into Vietnam so that that is my plan here. All right, so let's go ahead and use socialist governments just to get, get obligations clear from our hand. And we are going to, so we're going to let him pull three out, and we're going to get to put the three back. We do probably want to put the three back, but we're going to get a point into Thailand. So now we touch, Thai, we touch Laos, Cambodia. We're into Thailand. We're fully committed to the defense of Asia. He is going to he's going to go ahead and shuffle Korean War back in so that just in case it ever comes up later, maybe I'll trigger it and either give him ops or, or more stuff in Korea. So he is continuing his Asian play, and I guess it's possible he could have the Asian scorecard and be really going for it, so we need to make sure he can't dominate Asia this turn if he's already got it. So we need to have some countries... And if we go into Thailand, there we go. Now he doesn't dominate Asia. And I'm going to go ahead and fortify, use the extra point from Fidel. Now, Fidel is going to put him into play over in uh, Central America. I'm okay with putting him in over there, partially because it gives him some skin in the game in, in the Americas or in Africa. You want them to have skin in the game in some battlegrounds, at least one battleground there, because that way the CIA card is more of a problem for him if he has to play it at DEFCON 2. Now, it's not DEFCON 2 yet, but it's not a huge blow to give it to him a little bit early. So we're going to go ahead and endure that. Now, that brings a turn to an end, and we did lose the one point to ops because we only had two when the DEFCON was three. That's, that's reasonable. And we're going to go to turn two. Now, DEFCON is going to go to four. And let's look at our hand. All right. So we have got European scoring. I'm very happy to see that, because that means we're probably going to be able to, to score five points from that if something doesn't go horribly wrong. Now, what else do we have? We got Truman Doctrine, good to play for, good to play for Europe with. Got a couple of his cards, but none of them that are a huge big deal. Vietnam revolts will be easy for us to dispense with later in the turn because 
he, um, you know, we've already controlled Thailand and Laos, Cambodia, so that might be our very last play. And it does mean what well, it's a little harder for us to use Vietnam as one of our ways of defending. One of our ways of defending Asia, we could space Vietnam revolts if we really need to, because we don't have anything else that we absolutely have to space. And that then brings us to the question of what we should headline. And we're not really long on great headlines here. So Truman Doctrine is a useless headline because he doesn't have any empty, naked countries. And in fact, it, Truman is, is a card we want to keep in play as an event as a threat, so he won't want to come threaten us in Europe uh, for as long as possible. So we don't want to headline that. Eastern European unrest is basically useless because, first of all, we're going to be scoring Europe. Second of all, we're going to have to play Warsaw Pact anyway, so he's going to get a pile of more guys over there. So trying to cut his cut his influence by three and change with a three ops card, not very useful. And CIA, I would really rather shuffle that back in for him to draw because it's you know, it would have been much better if he drew that this turn because that would be a problem for him. But since I drew it, I would rather shuffle it back in and maybe he can get it next turn or in one of the future turns. And he could end up having a real problem with that card because he can't play it at DEFCON 2 without losing the game now that he's got something in, in Cuba or you know any other African or American battleground. And so that brings me to the slightly risky, I wouldn't say it's greatly risky play, but it's a slightly risky headline of headlining the European scoring card. It's risky because he could headline Suez, which would rob us of domination, or he could headline De Gaulle, and that would also rob us of domination. But because we're at four in France, De Gaulle is maybe not quite as attractive of a headline for him. And so I feel like I feel like it's a reasonable risk. And given that I don't have anything else I really want to headline, and I would definitely like to just grab the five points from Europe, I think it's a reasonable risk to go ahead and do that. So let's headline Europe and see what we can do. Okay, so he has put the purge on us. We are purged. And that's okay. The good news is we get our five points for Europe. Uh, we successfully snuck that out. Now there is some bad news. Well, there's first there's the basic bad news, which is now our hand went from kind of mediocre to it really sucks. It's just not a great hand. All of our all of our ones are still ones. We've got two twos that are now ones and they're unspaceable. And our three cards are now only worth two. But there's kind of worse news, which is that turn two is the normal turn, the odds-on turn for the Soviet player to play the blockade card. Now, normally the Soviet player plays a blockade card to force decolonization or destalinization out of our hand because we have to discard a card and so we don't have enough cards left in our hand to have a whole card, and so we have to get rid of them. If we have them, we have to space them or, or play them, even worse. And so a little extra side note of bad news is we don't even have decolonization or destalization, which means it is growing more and more likely that he either already has them or is going to get them. But even worse is... We don't have a single card left that we could discard successfully to blockade. So if he has blockade, he's almost certainly going to play it as his last action because that's the best time normally to play blockade as a Soviet player. And when he does it, we're going to have to give him West Germany because we don't anymore, now that everything's minus one, we don't have a three card left to discard. So we're just going to have to eat that. The one little silver lining is we did manage to go ahead and score Europe before any of that happened. So, so we got our five points, and we're up to a beautiful six on the scoreboard. So let's see what he's got for his first action round. 
he has got a UN mediated, ooh, a UN mediated Marshall Plan. So he does not want to give us Marshall Plan in Europe, even though we just scored Europe. That is interesting. And he is going to, yes, he's going to have a huge coup in Thailand. And okay, that went better than it could have. We just barely survived his giant hairy coup in Thailand. Because if he got in with one, with only our two ops, we couldn't even, I mean, we couldn't even cover him to the point where he'd have to use the whole China card. If he'd gotten in with even one point, he'd be able to just beat us into Thailand. So that was, that was pretty grunty. Now, the, the, the thing is, now I have another problem. Because obviously I had originally hoped to take, to, you know, with the DEFCON staying at three and therefore dropping to four, that I was going to get a coup now. And therefore I was going to get military ops and therefore I wasn't going to lose two points to him at the end of this turn. But right now, because he did enough damage to us in Thailand, it means that he currently dominates Asia. And... So I think if he scored it right now, let's see, he has got three battlegrounds to R1, so that's two. But So he would get six points, but I think it is a five-point swing for us if we, if we matched, you know, stopped his domination and had one more battleground in Thailand. That would be a net five points saved for us, assuming he is currently holding the the age of scoring card, which it is approximately 50-50 that he was at the beginning of the turn. He's certainly playing very aggressively in, in Asia. So the question is, do I go ahead and take a coup? And it would be a really stupid coup, too. It would be a, it would be a coup in Cuba? Just to get a coup in a battleground, just to get a coup at all, because there's no non-battlegrounds like a coup. So just to get military ops, I could take a, a terrible little coup in Cuba, which probably wouldn't do anything, but it would save us two points at the end of the turn. Or I could use the two points to go into Thailand, tying him on total countries and gaining a battleground for ourselves, which would net us five points at the time of Asian scoring, which might be this turn. You know, it's at least approximately 50-50 likely that it's happening this turn. The reason I say that is because the amount of cards that he got in his hand at the beginning of the turn is about equal to the cards that are left in the discard pile right now, meaning that for any cards I haven't seen yet, it's about even odds that they're either in his hand or the discard pile. Now, as we go through the turn, you know, the, the situation becomes a little more complex, but I have to kind of think of it right now as there's a really good chance he's got the Asia card, and I have to trade off the definitely giving him two points, or almost definitely. I mean, he could not take a coup next, but he probably is gonna, because uh, he's got places to do that that, that add to his, you know, add to his position. So probably giving him two or risk giving him five. And so to me, two, five, two, five, and, and five, even at kind of 50, 50 is two and a half. So it feels like I really need to go ahead, just suck it down and fill up Thailand. So I'm going to do that. Do it with Warsaw Pact. He's going to get a bunch of guys in Eastern Europe. Not a huge deal. Since he already had Romania, he's already got fuel for his destalinization if he gets destalinization. So I'm not really giving a whole lot up, and I'm keeping, at least I'm keeping the horrible Warsaw Pact late war version from coming into play. He's going to take a coup with Olympic Games. And as predicted, go ahead into Panama, and as maybe not predicted, but certainly he was out there, he rolled a six, and he is hugely into Panama, and we are hugely out, which is too bad, but 
sometimes it happens. All right, so other obligations to fulfill. We've got this horrible Arab-Israeli war. Now that he's got ops, he's got plenty of ops, he's taken coups, we don't care if he gets ops, we'd rather him not get Israel on some points. So Arab-Israeli war is only worth one, and so I think what I'm going to do is play one into Lebanon so that now we have two protector countries on Israel, and we'll go ahead and take the role, and he does not succeed, so we got away with that, and we have another another country in the Middle East just to kind of reinforce our presence and stave off his domination. Okay, well, bad news. He's got decolonization, and now that the DEFCON is two, he's going to go in and create more problems. Okay, so he's, he's gone into Africa, which is always expected, and those are perfectly reasonable places to go, especially, you know, he didn't need to go to Algeria as badly when we were already in France. He's broken our control of Thailand, and even more brutally in this sort of land war in Asia we got going on, he has gone into Indonesia, which was going to be an easy gimme for us to pick up in, in restoring our numbers. And so he's back in the catbird seat on dominating Asia, which we don't want him to be able to do. So I think we're going to go ahead and use another of our two cards to fill up Thailand. And this time we have to fortify it have to over-control it because otherwise he could use the China card to take over control all in one play. Because we, if we were only up by two, then playing five points lets him use the first two to pay the iron price to put one in and break control, and then the other three get him all the way to, to total control. And we don't want that. So we've not been able to this time, so that doesn't stop him from dominating Asia. It does at least save Thailand, and that's really the best we're going to be able to do in this purge state. So I think we're about to find out if he's got the Asia card. If he's got the Asia card, he's going to play it now and dominate. Okay, he doesn't have the Asia card. So that means Asia card's coming up next turn for sure, which honestly is actually really good news from a whole bunch of fronts. One, because he didn't just get five points, and Two, because it means that when Asia does score, it's not going to score again for a long time, which, you know, in, in regions where we're not doing well, we would like to have them not score nearly as often. So having them score on the, uh, the reshuffle turn, turn three, is good. I think this time I can keep up with him in Asia. We'll use the five-year plan and just go ahead and tie him in total countries. All right, captured Nazi scientists for influence. So that's interesting. That's exciting. Good news for us because he could have played that for a point. And not only a point, but a, you know, a move, a guaranteed move down the space track to contest with us, you know, the other points that are available later down the space track. So the fact that he didn't means, well, it means we know we're better off in the space race point race thing. And a really good piece of news is he, he saw fit to put it into Vietnam, which it, clearly it helps his, you know, he's doing it for a reason. He, he's trying, he's, he sees this race for, you know, having the eight countries in Asia and he wants to dominate. He wants to scrunt out five horrible points. And since he touches it, he thinks he's going to get it. It does mean now that Vietnam Revolt is going to be a free play for us because giving him two more guys in Vietnam is really no big deal. We'll be happy to do that. For the knots, though, we're going to go ahead and get CIA shuffled in. We want to get that definitely played before before the turn three reshuffle comes in. So we're going to go ahead and play it. And given the ferocity of this Asian influence war, I'm going to go ahead and put this one into Taiwan, which 
first of all, moves us closer to owning Taiwan, which would actually, for the moment, give us give us eight countries in Asia. The point in Laos, Cambodia is certainly, since we don't have any over control, is certainly vulnerable. But it's moving us along there, and it makes it harder for him to just grab Taiwan, and in turn, that keeps. We do have the Formosan Resolution active, which wouldn't save us from domination, because if he does four to three, then he still dominates. But it could be a point for you. So maybe the Formosan domination will help us a little bit, and we certainly don't want to just let him grab it for nothing. So I'm just going to go ahead and stick a point in there, pollute it a little bit. He's less likely to grab it at four, and it makes it easier for us later on if we decide we need to. So here's that bad news we talked about before, is he did have the blockade, he did play it, and there has just been nothing to be done. There was nothing this whole turn we could have done about it. He got the right cards, he played them, and we did not have a four. Now if you get purged on turn two and you have a four in your hand, you're going to want to think very hard before you play that four ops card, like if you're just sitting there with NATO or something, because that's your only card you could discard a blockade. So do think about that. If you get purged on turn two as the U.S., and you've got stuff in West Germany, and you're holding a four card, hold that four card until your last round. And the great thing is if you hold it and he doesn't use it, well, then you've got a great four card to make your action round six play to break his control, you know, to just be horrible to him with your end of the turn play. But bring us back to the sad reality of this turn. We have, there is absolutely nothing for it than to click do not discard and just eat it. So that makes it very easy to decide what the next card is because we certainly, with West Germany sitting there open, we want to hold on to Truman Doctrine, because as long as he doesn't know where it is, and especially when next turn he immediately figures out that we definitely have it, he's not going to be hauling into West Germany. So we're going to play Vietnam Revolts. It's a free play, because he's just going to get extra guys in Vietnam that he already controls. And I need to put at least one point into West Germany so that he can't grab the whole thing in four points. So now... With a point in there, even if you put four ops in, he wouldn't control it, and I could play Truman Doctrine as the event and just wipe him out. He doesn't want that. He knows that can happen. So that is how the turn is going to end. Now, he managed to outmaneuver us on military ops through the whole Thailand, Asian, the land war in Asia situation. And so he gets his two dirty little red points for military ops, all of his horrible events go out of play, and we go to turn three. Now this is the turn of the reshuffle. So the cards that get dealt to us here before the reshuffle, he knows we have. He knows we've got De Gaulle. He knows we've got Suez Crisis. He knows we've got Socialist. No, not Socialist Cover. He knows we have Duck and Cover. He knows we have Special Relationship, and he knows by power of elimination that we have Truman Doctrine. Now, these other cards, he does not know that we have those because those have already come up in play. Now, likewise, we know that he has certain cards. We know that he has Asian scoring, and that's a little bit unfortunate because we would have liked to control the timing of that make sure he didn't dominate. So it's, it's much harder when he controls the timing and we have to keep defending Asia. So we're probably going to have another turn of defending Asia. He also has destalinization. So there was still some hope that we could draw that and get send at least one of his best cards happily off the space. But it didn't happen. This is going to be a decolonization and destalinization kind of game because he's got both of them. Meanwhile, he's also got the nuclear test ban, a big honking four card, and he's got the Cambridge Five, which is just a two-ops card and is probably not a big deal. So that is how things stand. And this is where we're going to stop. 
we're going to leave you with the traditional Twilight Struggle Play the Experts homework assignment. So your homework assignment, as always, is first of all to evaluate our hand, and second of all to decide what is our appropriate and best headline for turn three, and then having headline the headline you think we should headline, then what is your plan for the turn? What should we be doing? How are we going to be dealing with his Asia card, his desalinization, and just the general communist situation that we are facing here? So, you think about those things. Tell me in comments. Let's get a discussion going in comments about what could happen next and why and all of that stuff. And we'll see you next time on Twilight Struggle. Play the experts.